Our text will come from the Old Testament book of Amos, and we'll get to it here in a moment. You will remember that Amos was one of the Old Testament prophets in the breakdown of the books of the Old Testament. We come to the prophetic section, then it may be divided into two sections of major and minor prophets. Major does not mean they're more important than the minor. It means they're more lengthy. And the minor prophets are less lengthy. All of it is the Word of God, and all of it is important to us. Of course, we today are under authority to Christ, and we approach God under the Christian system revealed in the last will and testament of Christ, the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. Yet the marvelous object lessons of the Old Testament serve to strengthen every one of us to be faithful, more faithful to God under the truth of the New Testament. Amos lived and prophesied during the days of Jeroboam, the king of Israel, the northern kingdom. This is in the time of the divided kingdom. The kingdom of Israel composed of ten tribes to the north and then the kingdom of Judah composed primarily of the tribe of Judah and the very small tribe of Benjamin. It was at Bethel where Jeroboam placed his golden calves and said this is where these ten tribes are to worship because he did not want them to return to Jerusalem and Solomon's temple. He was political. He wanted to have his own nation. Religion didn't mean anything to him except as a way to keep his authority as an absolute monarch over the northern kingdom. So he set up his own priests and set up his own way of worship. Amos is from the southern kingdom. He's from a little town called Tekoa, which is about 12 or so miles southeast of Jerusalem in Judah. God has chosen him, and I've always liked Amos. It doesn't mean I reject the others. It just means I, I like Amos. Amos was a herdsman and a keeper of sycamine trees. Now, it says in the King James sycamore tree, but it's not like our sycamore trees that we're used to. These sycamine trees bore a fruit something like a fig. And I've actually seen them. And the way that they caused them to ripen was to either poke a hole in the end of them or pinch them. And they, they look just like figs. But the tree is rather shaped like these live oaks out front, just not that big. But they do make a pretty good sized fig tree. So when Amos is taking care of the flocks and taking care of his orchard of sycamine trees, he has quite a bit of work to do as the people of that time who were of the country and lived off the country had to do. So he's not a schooled prophet, but he's dedicated to God. He's faithful to God. And God chooses this person from the southern kingdom to go and to prophesy against the evils of the northern kingdom. So he sounds out what is a series of dire and ominous prophecies against the ten tribes of Israel and their apostasy. Now they had a high priest up there who was Amaziah, and he sought to silence him. And when he sought to silence Amos, we find Amos crying out in Amos chapter 4 and verse number 12, Prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. So this portrays God, as it were, standing as an avenging challenger of these wicked people. His own people who had apostatized, who had given him up, who had run away from the truth as it was to them in the law of Moses. 
And then to this, Amos added, Thy wife shall be a harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by line, and thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity. Amos 7 and verse 17. Now there's no way you can read those words and say the picture that they draw is a pretty picture. There's nothing pleasant about the prospect those words set out to people. But we know from the study of the rest of the Old Testament it all came to pass. In our recent study of Isaiah, we noticed that Assyria took over, conquered, and carried the northern kingdom into captivity from which it never returned. It threatened, of course, Judah, but it wasn't time for Judah to answer for its sins. They would exist another hundred or so years. Then they would go away into Babylonian captivity for the same reason that the people of the north had. Although we know from Ezra and Nehemiah the prophecies before that in the Old Testament that a remnant of Judah would return and this they did after 70 years of captivity. What would I say about this? No one sins with impunity. If you transgress God's law, for sin is the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4, you're going to pay the price. doesn't mean that you can't get forgiveness of those sins, but sin is a heinous thing. If you have transgressed the will of heaven in sins of omission or commission, omission being you've left undone what God obligated you to do, then so it is that you'll pay the price. When Amos was confronted by this false priest, Amaziah, the high priest said, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son. I should say Amos said to the high priest. But I was a herdsman, a gatherer of sycamore fruit, and the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, Go prophesy unto my people Israel. Amos 7, verses 14 and 15. Now that's Amos just saying to him, I'm here by commission of God. I was busy taking care of my business, which was as he described it. I would not have left there except that the Lord said, Go, and I went. He was unlike Jonah who heard the command and didn't want to go and tried to run away. He simply dropped all he was doing and I, surely he had important matters to do. But he went ahead and put God first. And this is reminiscent of the commission God has given from our Lord to the church of go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I want to pause here and interject this. In this great apostasy that's been going on for quite a few years in the Lord's church, not only is the church being corrupted in various ways, but one thing that gets hurt very badly when all this kind of thing's going on is the concern for souls that don't know the gospel and the concern for evangelism to continue to preach the gospel to every creature. You know, it just doesn't make any difference what evils are going on in the church to corrupt it. Corrupt it. That does not say that we're relieved of the commission that belongs to the church, whereby we cooperate with God to sound out the saving gospel message to those who've never heard it. We have that obligation right here. Small in, the, in number, though we are, compared to maybe many other congregations, Although the church as a whole is smaller in number than it's been in many, many years, we still are under obligation to use all of our powers and facilities and whatever we have to preach the gospel to every creature. 
Now that doesn't mean just someone like me, but it means every single solitary one of us as Christians, to the best of our ability, are expected to be spreading the gospel. It may be in our own families where we begin. It may be in our neighbors. It may be in those we work with. It may be in those we go to school with. We have that obligation to confront them with the fact that they are lost in sin. And if they die in that state, there's no hope for them. That God has loved them and given them the gospel to save them. It is truly God's power unto salvation, Romans 1.16. And we must realize it's easy sometimes in dire circumstances to be ashamed of that gospel. Sometimes I think we think of being ashamed of it means, well, I just won't tell anybody at all about what the Bible says about anything. Well, that certainly would, should make a Christian ashamed. But it means, too, when we have opportunities with our neighbors, with those we work with on the job, wherever it might be, wherever we can get in a word in some way or the other to cause them to be giving their attention to their spiritual state, then we have an obligation to do it. And the best example I can see of that is how the Lord did his own teaching. Much of what we preach from pulpits like this come from one-on-one -on -one teaching the Lord did. And we yearn for the days of past when we would have gospel meetings and run the buildings over convert many people, those days aren't here anymore in the way they once were. And I say again, in the way they once were. But the obligation placed on the church is still here. Back in the day when the people and the morals of this land were closer to what the Bible teaches, people accepted the God as Father, or God is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is Savior, and that man was in sin, and he needed salvation, and he couldn't save himself. People were caught up in false religions and denominationalism, but yet they still believed those things. Then we spent our times trying to show them in right division of the Word where they were wrong in certain areas. They were right in the belief in God and Christ and the Bible and so forth, they needed to order themselves correctly according to the truth as it is concerning the plan of salvation and the church and so on. Well, we don't see those people around much anymore, and there's not a lot of interest. But people in that day and time in the church, faithful Christians, would discuss these things with their neighbors. That's the reason when a gospel meeting came along, there had been many discussions going on over a period of months, and these people would come out. Now that evidence is a great interest on the part of people due to their background that they would come out and hear people preach and compare and contrast what they believed with what was being preached and they would study their Bibles. I understand that. But we're taught to preach the Word. Watch it. Be instant in season. And here I'm afraid is where we are. Out of season. What does that mean? I think Brother Marshall Keeble had the simplest commentary on the meaning of preaching the word in season and out of season. It's preach it to them when they want it, but also preach it to them when they don't want it. Our obligation then is the church is to live righteous before God and to preach the truth no matter how people deal with it. Amos was like that. This was written aforetime for your learning and my learning that we can benefit under the teaching of the New Testament. You'll see that Amos was both willing and able to accept the charge God had given him. You know, God can use us according to our knowledge and abilities and the strength of our faith. And so if we want to do greater things for the Lord and remain faithful and be edifying to the church and reaching out to those outside of Christ with the gospel, then let us grow and develop in our own knowledge and practice of the truth and ability to teach it to others. When Amos preached, his preaching was not a light matter. I think we can safely say that the thunderings of Amos for social justice under the law of Moses is still heard today. 
Now, we've got to realize that Israel was fleshly Israel. They were a literal nation among all other nations. The spiritual law of Israel was also their social law, also their civil law. So it varies in that sense. But you can still see among the people who are most ignorant of God and His Word that the various political platforms continue to cry out for some kind of justice, though I don't think they hardly know what true, real, biblical justice is. There is built within you and me and all men a sense of things ought to be a certain way, and they ought not be another way. How would we ever recognize right from wrong if there wasn't built within us the ability so to do? So we need to understand that there are people who are on the wrong road and what they advertise and what they advocate when it comes to justice in society. It all comes down to each individual being approached with the truth concerning their own conduct before God. When you get each individual of a society converted to Christ, you've converted the whole society. And you can see the impact of truly preaching the gospel in the first century when those who were not converted said of Paul and his preaching and they came into the city, these are they that have turned the world upside down. They were impacting all manner of individuals and it was changing the comfort zones of those who were wedded to idolatry and immorality. We have that obligation today. With the great advent of hardened worldliness in the world, then there comes a response from God's people to very plain, bold, frank, candid, and pointed language as to how such things is wrong and they must be changed. I say look to the prophets and especially Amos to see how that's done. Amos accepted his commission he accepted it with great humility. But being humble does not rule out as he was a very bold and courageous man to do the thing his God had assigned him to do and commissioned him to do. You know, a plumb line measures just how straight something is. And the Lord dropped the plumb line on Israel and it was crooked. Amos used what they understood. They knew the place of a plumb line, building a building. Amos 7, 7 through 9. And he simply says, you're God's building, but you transgressed God's will, and you made the whole building crooked. There was no hint of evasion or compromise at all in his voice. I think we ought to understand one can be as humble as possible, one can be full of humility and love of God and love of the truth and love of lost men and women, boys and girls, but still preach plainly and boldly the truth. In fact, that's the kind of person that will. Jesus was as humble as it's possible to be, and yet he was bold and forthright in the truth that he taught. And though opposed by influential enemies, Amos, as well as Christ, the apostles, they never faltered in their loyalty and devotion to God, His Word, and the justice that that Word brought when people believed it and obeyed it from the heart. But Amos doesn't turn back on his people. Even though they rejected him and fought against him, he does not turn back. And we dare not do the same today. People's souls are so important. I wish we valued our own souls like God does. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And we're taught in Romans 12 that we're to deliver our bodies as living sacrifices. A sacrifice is when you give up something very important to you. Maybe at times very needful, but it's very important and you could use it. But for the cause of Christ, and the salvation of the souls of men, you put those things aside and you put the teaching of the truth and defense of the same before all those things. 
In Amos' day, there was still time and opportunity for Israel to repent toward God for their sins against Him. If not, God would not have chose Amos to go up there and preach those things. And Amos still pleads for God's people. He still begs them and implores them to return to God. Eventually, as we read through here, we see the prophet sounding out what I consider to be a most heart-rending and touching appeal. God will not repent of his proposed wrath unless Israel turns back to him. Therein is the key to your life and being acceptable to God and my life. And so we still cry out to one another to keep us on the straight and narrow way as Christians and to those outside of Christ. God stands ready to forgive everybody, but they've got to change to fit what he teaches. And Amos recalls all the things that had happened to them, the blasting of the gardens, the vineyards, the fig and olive trees, all kind of pestilences brought upon the people. Why? Because God hated them? No. Because God wanted them to see that you have left me. These things are to cause us to realize that. I want to remind you that every time you read in the Old or New Testaments of God's judgment, brought against an individual or a city or a kingdom or whatever, the whole world in case of the flood, because they would not turn. They determined to do their own thing. That all of those judgments preview the coming final judgment at the end of the world where justice will be meted out perfectly. Now listen to this summation. Amos says, Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, speaking on behalf of God, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. Amos 7, 9 through 12. Now here's the truth of the matter. However brief or extended our life in the flesh is, we are to use that time to prepare to meet our God. Now, as we sit here this morning and stand here, are we by our lives saying, I'm prepared to meet my God in the judgment. I'm prepared to go before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of the deeds done in the body. I know that because I can know the Word of God and I can compare and contrast my life with it. And I can see that I'm in harmony with what he expects of Christians. I can see that I'm striving to grow in the study of the Bible and in prayer and doing whatever the Lord enjoins upon Christians to do to accomplish the cause of Christ. I'm covered by the blood of Christ as I do so, 1 John 1, 7. And the great grace of God is bestowed upon me because I seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto me. We can know whether God comes first in our thoughts, words, and actions. We can know whether we're ordering our lives according to the teachings of Christ in the New Testament, or we're not. And we can know, if we're not, what to do to be restored once again to our first love. And I'm thankful God so created us. You know, He could have made us robots. We would have no choice in the matter. We would not be able to respond to the truth or reject it. We would just do whatever we were programmed to do. You ask yourself the question, why do birds, and we just use them for an example, every spring build a nest? Do you think they sit down and say, well, spring's coming. We're going to have a nest. Now, we had this kind of nest last year. It didn't work too well. We want to build this kind of nest this year. In fact, we need to go get this kind of straw and this kind of twig and whatever. Why birds don't do that? Why do they build a nest every spring? They couldn't help themselves. They're programmed that way. Genetically, they just do it. That's the way God made them to operate. 
And so it is so much the animal kingdom. But we, while we have certainly genetic aspects about our being, we have a will because a spirit dwells in this body. It's the real you and me. We can think. We can study. We can know. And we can know whether we're on God's side or we're not. And if we're not, we can know what to do to be saved from our sins or if we're unpenitent, repent and be faithful again. These people are coming to the end of their opportunities to change. They've delayed too long and now they must confront an avenging God. He at last will obtain justice. I don't want to wait to that. I don't want to try God's patience as it were. I don't want to ignore the long suffering of God with me. I want to use that time to try to study the Bible and to work on myself to bring every thought into subjection to Jesus Christ. To set my affections on things above and not on things on this earth but the will to do His will. The people of Israel had enjoyed a period of prosperity, of wealth, and of power. And they looked at that and they then boasted of their security from enemies. They trusted in all of that as well as their natural resources. And they magnified beyond measure their accomplishments. But it caused pride to be within them. They ignored the teachings of God's word concerning how Israel was to live and take care of the poor and the needy. Many social injustices were in Israel. There was all kind of political corruption, all kinds of religious vanity. Now, as I go through that, does all that remind you of conditions somewhere today? It ought to remind us of our own nation. Another prophet drew the sad picture in these words. For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. Hosea 8, 7. Right now, America is doing all it can to sow the wind. In fact, we've just noticed this hurricane of recent times and what it did. But make a spiritual application of that. America is sowing a wind like that throughout all of its existence. And we will reap worse than that. Amos saw the sordid attempts to remedy the plight of the people, but do so through human wisdom and opinion, all kinds of political promotions. But you can't read Amos or the other prophets and not see that none of them worked. They were still headed for a terrible tragedy. I think I can say that a candid appraisal of our religious activities will show a terrible parallel, an alarming parallel to Israel's fall. Today, our religious fervor is being dampened and has been for some years by hireling preachers and weak-kneed elders, watered-down sermons delivered in culture oratory and social grace while speaking the plain, adulterated word of God that sets forth true spirituality. What is truly acceptable to God is set aside. We have still in this country, and it all began to happen in the late 50s and throughout the 60s and the 70s, all kinds of ornate buildings. Many of those buildings set today, auditoriums, 400 and 1,000, and maybe two or 300 people in those auditoriums. I can count some of them and know them directly. While a few years ago they may have had three or 400 people, today they have 100. Now why is that the case? Well, granted, we live in a world, as I said earlier, that's not as disposed to seek after God, not as interested in religion. I understand that. 
But I know also if the church had remained like the New Testament teaches ought to remain, and elders had been elders like the Bible says they ought to be, and preachers had preached the truth, and elders wouldn't let preachers in the pulpit, they wouldn't. They would demand preachers preach the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, the whole counsel of God. And if they had practiced corrective church discipline consistently, souls would have been saved and the church kept pure. That hasn't been the case. We're, we've been uh, smothered by every kind of device known to man and campaigning and promoting experts in whatever this is and all kinds of different this, that, and the other and revivals and special workshops and giant rallies and recreational functions of every description. There's every kind of drive and every kind of dinner and banquet and every kind of youth activity. There's organizations like Golden Reapers, and I call them the -the over-the-hill saints, all sorts of things put together at the ingenuity of man. And where is the church and the gospel? Why haven't all those things done what they told us they would do? Why, back in the 70s, churches went haywire over buses. Well, I'm not opposed to using transportation of every description to bring in people, to bring in young people. That's a wonderful thing. But it always bothered me when you had people driving to worship in their cars. And maybe there's room for two or three more in that. And when you put the whole congregation together, if they just go by and pick up people in their cars, they could be bringing 30 or 40 or 50 kids. But they had to buy a bus before they could think to do that. Because we got to be like everybody else. Brother, the late brother and much lamented Bill Jackson wrote years ago, The Best Hamburgers in Town and call an article by that name. And by that he meant the gimmicks were being used to where some buses, they even would hide a $5 bill under a seat and tell the kids, come on there and whoever finds it can get it. And then they even told about a situation to where one church of the bus came up the intersection and came up with it to another church in the bus, and the fellow jumped off and said, hey, kids, we're going to McDonald's after time's over. Where are you going? And so that bunch jumped off one bus, got on another. Well, you say, surely that didn't happen. Well, it didn't happen in a lot of places. But why must it take something that we think up as a method, that's all it was, before we can do things? Now, question. If that was to have accomplished what we were told it would have accomplished 30 and 40 years ago, Where are the results of it? Where are the members of the church who know far more Bible and live it than ever did? Well, they don't. And you can have gatherings like polishing the pulpit or sharpening the sword. I asked one time somebody said that. I said, well, whoever dulled it in the first place, it needs sharpening. You can call all sorts of things. That sounds good. We thought of it. And as you see, we, we can try to build our tower of Babel unto heaven that we get a name. And so the things we think of, and I ask the question, all right, what good did they do? What good did they do? And by good, I mean, did it help people come to greater knowledge of the truth, live more like Christ? Did it cause people to love the souls of men, women, boys, and girls in sin and need of the gospel? Did it train more preachers? Did it help them to be grounded in the faith? Did it raise up elders who are determined to shepherd the flock, like the Bible said, and preachers who are fearlessly preach the truth? I'm ashamed to say I don't think it has, and I say it by the evidence before us, not by just me saying it, because I lived through all those years. I was preaching in one place, and I knew that this delegation that came from another city of several men were there to hear me and to consider me for a work somewhere else. And that was in the days when busing was the greatest and you weren't anything in service to God if you didn't have several buses to drag them in. Well, I say again, I'm not opposed to transportation. That can bring them in. But, you know, motive for having them sometimes says a whole lot. And I knew they were very big on that. And so in the sermon I preached that night, I preached on going to hell in the joy bus. Well, I explained myself. I pointed out I wasn't against using any kind of transportation possible to be able to get as many people into the auditorium as possible. 
to teach them the truth. But when we put all of our so-called eggs in that basket, thinking that just by merely transporting those kids in a bus, and we couldn't do it in cars or some other way, that that's going to accomplish things in and of itself alone, it's going to make us the greatest soul winners on earth. Well, I think we've learned the results of that over the years. So you see, there's still the element of the world guiding us in our perspectives and viewpoints. And we like what we invent rather than what God said. Now again, don't go away saying I'm opposed to methods of being able to reach people and different options to choose from to reach people and bring them to church. I'm not. Not at all. But I'm saying when you think that's going to solve problems in spreading the gospel, you'll learn if you stay at it long enough, it won't. We are, we are like so many people. We like fads. Some of us live long enough to see clothing fads. Anybody remember the sack dress well, they had it labeled right. Do you remember, and they're still around too some, the women's pants suits? And you would have thought that that was the only way women could dress was to put on a pants suit. They wouldn't be caught dead in a dress. Well, I don't think that pants suits are men's clothing or anything else. But there were folks I remember back as a younger preacher, especially the older women 50 years ago, who weren't disposed to wear pants suits. And I know one congregation, I can call its name right now, that the women wanted, the younger women wanted to wear those pants suits. And they knew it would offend the older women, but they all got together and planned on doing it, and they all wore their pants suits. Well, nothing wrong with yourself to wear a pants suit. I know that. But it helps to understand the other person for none of us are islands to ourselves and we don't live to ourselves. And the Bible teaches part of Christianity is to consider the other person. And why ramrod something that down somebody's throat when it doesn't amount to a hill of beans anyway? In fact, some of those same people are just as apt to take the pantsuit off and put on as little as they possibly can. And I do not think that some of those things are sexually enticing. Some of this fantex that put on people would scare a ghost of a thorn tree. There's nothing about it that's pretty. It exaggerates everything about a person that's ugly. Now, we all haven't got much to talk about when it comes to that, some of us more than others. But when we know we're a certain way, listen, simple guideline, cover it up. That's not hard to understand. Well, I tell you, the people of Amos' day had missed out on all that too for their culture and their time. They missed all of it. We are a people who seemingly cannot exercise common sense and day-to-day -day application of the truth in all aspects of Christian living. I, I just don't know what to think. But I do know to preach lessons like this. So what have all these things done? They're good only if people are using them to get the truth out, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. They're useless. This building is, is a good thing. It's here because we have to have a place to assemble. You can rent a building. You can lease it. You can buy land and build on it. That's how this thing's authorized, Colossians 3.17. But if you want to build just a monstrosity of everything under the sun, it ceases to be an advantage for the cause of Christ, an expedient, and it becomes something we glory in. And that messes it all up. I like the time when they used to call them church houses or the meeting house. That evidence is a proper understanding of why we got this building and why we even have classrooms. It's a place for the church to do what God ordains it to do, meet and to center to where they can do the things that need to be done. But we have to put our two cents in on it, and that usually messes it all up. The timely warning, going back to Amos, to Israel of old is therefore no less pertinent to our time. 
If we don't watch out, we have nothing but spiritual sham and hypocrisy. And it's no less a stench in the nostrils of God today as it was back in the days of Amos. Certainly, in our nation, it's not what it was 50, 60, and 70 years ago. Don't know that it ever will be again. But I'm here, and I'm a Christian, and I'm a gospel preacher. And I'm expected to live for God now. I can't go back to where it was even when I started preaching in the mid-60s. And I assure you things were considerably different then than they are now. But I can be what God says I ought to be right now. Whether it be a man or a husband or a father or a grandfather or a citizen or a neighbor, whatever. As a nation gone astray, America must turn back to God and listen. It's going to be the leavening influence of the church to do it. Oh, that's too great. There's not enough of us. How many people received the Great Commission originally? Apostles, they must have quivered in their sandals. When Jesus Christ, about to leave them, said to those apostles, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But by the time Colossians was written, Paul says, It was done. As far as I know, that's the only time in the history of the world since the church was established that a generation heard the gospel. Every person of that time had the opportunity to hear the gospel. Listen to what's said in Psalms 9, verse 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. Again, Psalms 9, 17. Let me ask you, are we forgetting God today in this nation? We certainly can't say the nation as a whole is remembering God, the God of the Bible. I'd say we're down the road of forgetting God. And I know what God says is going to happen. And His Word is true. More and more irreligion is shown in our national life. In the long ago, Job asked, can the rush grow up without mire? Can the flag grow without water? That's a flower. Whilst it is yet in its greenness and not cut down, it withereth before any other herb. So are the paths of all that forget God, and the hypocrite's hope shall perish. Job 8. 11 through 13. Crass commercialism and greed rose the American life. And political leaders make the headlines as they in one way or the other feather their own nest and pillage America. Our people are expecting a cure for their ills and amusements, pills and liquor and drugs and great pleasure unrestrained. Young people have turned in many cases into hoodlums and they war against decent people and they mug old ladies on the streets. Others rob every kind of convenience store. They just hurt people because they can not necessarily to take something from them. You see these people walking down the street, just walk up somebody and just knock the stuff inside of them. Why? They like to do it. You have bankers and others who are embezzling all sorts of things, their depositors in particular. And the shame of it all is that then the politicians rise up and try to say, here's the way we can take care of that. And what they offer turns out to only compound what they're trying to remedy. Listen to this. Psalm 127 and verse 1. Except, and that has the force of if and only if. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. Who built it? 
except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. God has been left out of our national life, left out more and more. And the dregs of corruption settle all over us, and none of us can escape it in the sense of it bothering every one of us. As a nation, I say with Amos, we must prepare to meet our God. The whole world's moving inexorably to the final day. Jesus in Matthew 25, verse 34 said, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation or the beginning of the world. Don't you want to hear that? Don't you want to be able to enter into that kingdom that never ends? It's free of all these things we've been talking about. Well, we can this is not some idle game show. If you spin the wheel right, you get it. No, we can. If we will but humbly embrace the truth and let nothing move us from it. As I bring the lesson to the close, I want to say again what is commonly said over the years by faithful gospel preachers. That heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. And here's the thing that must be understood. This life is the only place you can prepare to meet your God. This life is the only place you can prepare to go to heaven. There is no other. Those will be prepared for those, as we say, mansions in heaven. According to Revelation 7, verse 14, are those who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In Revelation 22, 14, the scripture reads, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter into the gates or into the city through the gates. Jesus was prepared to offer us such salvation, to escape all of the stuff that's around us and to preserve us through the gospel and our obedience to it. Till this world's over. And thus we read the writer of Hebrews saying, Though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And thus we do not hesitate to offer what the Bible offers. Salvation in Jesus Christ. All spiritual blessings in heavenly places, our Lord's located in the church, His spiritual body, Ephesians 1, 3. Entrance into that body comes to the one who on the basis of the evidence of the truth has been brought to belief in Christ, Romans 10, 17. Who is willing to turn from a practiced way of sin by turning from that and turning to Christ in repentance. Who will confess publicly that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. And then be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Those things are simple, but they demand a lot out of our inward man and our whole mindset on how we will shape our lives. If you haven't done that, then please consider doing that now. If not, you're not being able to prepare to meet your God on the terms that will get you into heaven. But know this. You will meet your God prepared to meet Him or not. And God doesn't want you to hear, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. He doesn't want you to hear that. He's done all He could to free moral agents to draw you to Him. And that's what we want. As a child of God, are you living faithful? If not, repent of those sins. Confess them and pray for forgiveness. Are you ready to go to heaven? If so, you'll do His will. And you'll start now while together we stand and sing.